Good afternoon. I think it's now just afternoon. It's 12 o'clock. Time for our agroecology session. Thanks very much for coming to listen. So this is all about water resilience. Uh, I think in the program it, it, it focuses more perhaps on, on drought, but of course uh, too much water is as much a problem in this country of ours as well. So we're going to cover that. Um, it's going to be a fairly simple format. To begin with, we'll introduce ourselves, and then we will touch on why water is important to consider in the farm uh, and what can be done about it. Then I think we'll have a quick round of questions uh, on why and what. And then after that, we will then go into the mechanics of change, how we can create change to look after water resources. Um, and, so, and then more questions at the end. So please hold on to those questions on the why, what, and how. Uh, as you go through. Um, so straight on to the introductions. Stephen, should we start with you? Quick one minute. Is it on already? Yeah, soon. Thank you. Uh, afternoon all. Uh, Stephen Briggs. I'm a farmer uh, in East Anglia, just about an hour north of here in, in um, Cambridgeshire. Uh, first generation farmer. We farm um, uh, cereals, agroforestry, uh, and some vegetables. On a as a new entrant on a farm with peat soils and also clay soils. Um, in a previous life, which I guess is why I'm sort of here, I spent the best part of a decade working overseas in Africa and Asia, working for people like the FAO and World Bank uh, on soil and border conservation. Uh, so my uh, my original life was as a soil scientist when soils were deeply unfashionable. Uh, I, I qualified as a soil scientist, and that's why I ended up working overseas. So I, I hopefully can bring a, a UK farming perspective and water perspective, but also uh, uh, some experience from environments where things are a lot more fragile, and a lot more brittle, where water is scarcer and uh, and has a, has a different value. Thank you. Ian, over to you. Hi there, Ian Simpson. I'm very much here from the community perspective. Um, Bloodington, my little village, flooded in 2020. We had eight inches in our property and 24 properties flooded. So I want to try and bring the perspective of the community and how we've connected with the landowners and how the landowners can then also support the community in actually mitigating flooding. Um, we flooded in 2020. We had a very close run in 2019. We're in something called flood zone. 3B, which for those who are interested, means that we've got a POE of one in uh, five, which means that every 20 years we should have a catastrophic flood. In fact, we've had catastrophic floods for um, three floods in 10 years. So uh, we decided to get together. Um, 2019 formed a flood group, and within five minutes it became apparent that the conversation was going to move on from flood signs and sandbags. <clears throat> we benefited immensely from quite an agile group. It's got an eclectic mix, um, contacts, apart from the intelligence, um, perseverance. So we started to put a, formulate a plan. And the first thing we knew we needed to do was connect with most of you guys, your landowners. And so to do that, um, we called in FWAG. We had a connection with FWAG through some work that actually my wife uh, did down at the Somerset levels um, during their flooding period. And FWAG came in and talked to the local landowners, very much on a general basis, but with NFM in, in mind. FWAG were very clear they're not flood engineers, and we appreciated that. So that was 2019, and we were progressing nicely. Then we had the catastrophe of 2020. So at that point, we took the bull by the horns. We produced um, a report. We produced videos of the flooding and sent that around to all of the disparate agencies that are involved. So we're talking Environment Agency, Natural England, local county council, local district council, so on and so forth. Um, they were quite surprised because they didn't realise we'd flooded, which was slightly um, surprising and slightly disappointing. And it turned out that our little catchment was the worst affected in Gloucestershire. So I'm based in the Cotswolds in a lovely village called Bleddington with a fantastic award-winning pub, if any of you are anywhere in that direction. Um, we moved on quite quickly, but the problem we've got is that um, our um, village is almost like the plug hole for where five main rivers meet. 
Now, my particular, the geology of our particular area is fairly shallow topsoil with a clay base. So it's the classic, fill the sponge up, it's not going to take any more water. Um, we have a real problem with surface water. Our flooding is very flashy, uh, which means it's brilliant, it just means it's very quick. So we have huge volumes of water coming down the catchment that surrounds us. We had eight inches in our house, and the, and the high street outside was four feet deep. The following morning at nine o'clock, there was just a puddle in the road. So what we were looking to do is to try and control the water as it's coming down and try and convey it past the village safely. Problem is, um, the water we were being uh, flooded by was on Main River, and that is EA responsibility. The surface water that then was coming into the village is, is down to the county council, district council. So we connected with the lead local flood authority, which is Gloucestershire County Council, and the lead coordinator there, James Blockley, very kindly agreed to lead the group. And so from that point on, we've been working assiduously to try and solve the problem of Bledington flooding, but specifically with an eye on the wider catchment because we don't want to just throw the water down to, the, to our neighbours. We want to do a coherent, comprehensive, connected approach, which Tim is involved with as well. And on, on that note, on the wider catchment, so we've got farmer, we've got very important stakeholders, the community, and then someone uh, that looks after the whole region. Um, I mean, if it turns water on here, it normally ends up like a boxing match. So <laughs> thankfully, you're off, off patch for me. Um, and Richard, you're probably one of the good ones. Let's hear, who are you? <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Rich Reynolds. I have the fortune of looking after the farming team in Anglian Water, which is a weird thing often, particularly when I'm talking inside the business and remembering water companies are typically engineering companies, put pipes in, pumps, machines and those sort of things, and that's where the specialism, that's where the skill is. Bringing, you know, our team has been going for about seven years now, and a lot of it was saying, well, how can we bring agriculture as part of the solution rather than just being part of the problem? And I say we sit on the fence. Half of the work we're doing is talking out to the agricultural communities around particular challenges that we have in, in, a, in an individual catchment around whether it be flooding, whether it be drought, whether it be particular nutrients or pesticides. The other half of it is then explaining what's happening in agriculture within the business. And that's a really important part of work we do because that's essentially where the resources get prioritized. Because what we are asking the business to do is to say, instead of investing in something where you've got guaranteed certainty, we can put in that filter, it's designed to a certain number of specs, we still want, we want to invest in a solution that doesn't have those certainties. You can't get a piece of paper that says, we guarantee it will perform, and you can't have a manufacturer that then you can come and say, well, it didn't perform. So a lot of our work is about bringing confidence, bringing trust that actually, agriculture is not necessarily going to solve everything but they very much can be part of that solution. Our work started off with, uh, with a pesticide called metaldehyde that I think a lot of people here will know about. It was really important for us because it was a relatively simple challenge that made it easy to communicate into the business of, here's a challenge, this is how we can put agriculture as part of that solution. And, and as the world of metaldehyde moves on, our scope is expanding a huge amount to include nutrients, the other range of pesticides, but increasingly water resilience, whether it be floods, whether it be droughts. Our scope as a water company is 28,500 square kilometres, so the whole of East Anglia. But I do know that the other representatives from other water companies around here and, and you know, other catchment teams. So we're in a unique perspective within the business of bringing agriculture as part of that solution to what we're doing. And every region is different. Brilliant. So we've got two real uh, 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 beneficiaries of looking after the water. But ultimately, Groundswell is wonderful because it's farmers here. And so let's hear from a farmer's perspective. Why specifically, Stephen, have you spent 20 odd years protecting your natural capital, particularly water? And how have you done that? So it's really interesting. We, well, I mean, we, we take water for granted in this country. You talk to an Australian farmer, anyone from Australia in the in the audience? A one. I, I knew... Uh, uh, I've listening. Uh, talk to an Australian farmer about drought, and, uh, or an African farmer, or an Asian farmer about drought, and they look at the UK, and when we scream drought, or we scream, scream deluge, they think we're deluded. 
you know, the fact that it rains on a regular basis or has done has uh, led us to not mean waters higher up the the, the um, importance sort of ladder ladder of importance. But with climate change, this is going to change. Um, you know, the Environment Agency have been saying for some time that their models will predict we will have much, much drier summers. We'll be regularly hitting uh, the high 30s, mid 30s, high 30s in temperature within the next 20 years. Uh, and then when it does rain, the intensity of that rainfall will be at least 25% higher. So when we get rain, it will come in big lumps. And then we've got to deal with those big lumps and that, the flooding that's associated with it and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the periods when we don't have rain and the implications for our crops and also our, um, our livestock. So as a farmer and as a soil scientist, for a long time I've been quite concerned about uh, how our soils function in terms of not only infiltration, but also water holding capacity. And if it read in a school report, it would not, like my school reports used to, it would say, could do better. Um, we've been spending the last 70 or 80 years uh, oxidizing and liberating and, and living off the fat of organic carbon in our soils. And the organic matter levels have been decreasing. And our water storage holding or our buffering capacity has been really, really reducing over a number of period of, period of time. So as farmers, what we need to do is concentrate on building that water holding capacity. So when it does rain, we can infiltrate. And when it is dry, we've got some resilience in our system. At home, what we've been doing is, is building organic carbon in the soils uh, over the last 20 years, but also introducing practices like cover cropping and also uh, agroforestry to help actually build that resilience, reduce evapotranspiration and loss from wind and actually, and actually build, um, build some capacity. Have you, have you done any research on the wind buffering and, and water retention on that? So the, the agroforestry systems at home uh, have reduced wind speed, and we sort of forget that actually, we're lucky today, it's not very windy, but we, we live in a very windy part of the world, and evapotranspiration is a big vector for water loss. So if we can cut down evapotranspiration from, from wind... By reducing wind speed, we can actually reduce a water loss at, uh, at, uh, uh, during periods of the year. First plug of the day, by the way. Stephen goes back quite a long way with agroecology, one of the founding sort of profiled farms. He is the godfather of agroforestry amongst, amongst another, of others. So if you need to find some information on any of this sort of thing, it's on agroecology. So, so the one thing, to use a quotation, with, and it, it, it uh, aligns with water really well, um, Eric Morcom once said, I'm playing all the right notes, but not necessarily in the, in, in the right order. And it's the same with water, in that we've got plenty of water, but often we don't manage it in terms of keeping it and resourcing it really well. I live in the East Midlands, and there's a big reservoir near me called Rutland Water. Um, it, I'll just remind myself of the figures to give you some kind of scope. But it, it covers four and a half square kilometres and holds 124 million litres of water. And the local drainage authority were quite proud at a, a presentation a couple of years ago that they'd evacuated twice that volume of water over the winter out to sea. So they'd done their job really well in terms of moving water away from urban areas and away from catchments. But what does that say to us when we then scream drought? It means we're good at managing water in terms of moving water, we're not necessarily good at capturing and managing water as a resource for, for crop crop production and, and for livelihood. So we need to get better at that. So Richard, you know, water is a pretty valuable asset in the east of England. Um, yeah, why why should farmers be looking at it? And what have you got any sort of really practical examples of, of the projects that you've been working on that perhaps we could refer to? I think. You know, that comment, well, looking at how the seasons are going to be changing, I was prepping for this, looking at what the figures are. And at the moment, we have slight success compared to what we need for, for our customers. But in the next 20 to 30 years, that's very quickly going to move from an excess to a deficit, whether it be environmental pressures, which will mean that we have to shut down abstractions and those sort of things, population, growth, climate, all of those sort of things. We also, pollution events and that sort of stuff, we talk about water foregone. So... In an ideal world, we can run the pumps all the time and we'll be bringing in water. But 
if a pesticide comes through or something like that, we switch the pumps off so that that doesn't go into the reservoir so you don't contaminate it. The problem is that that's water that you could have used that's got out to sea that you've lost for whatever reason. You know, when floods happen, it all comes... And it's that water for gone that's a big challenge. Now, previously it was very much pesticide-focused. I've been talking internally about what's the next challenge that sits there, and one of the most important things is turbidity. It's the water's too dirty, so we can't pump it in because we can't get the treatment processes to get the water clean enough. And to me, that's absolutely something that ties into the soil, the soil health. We look at it at a big scale, at a catchment, at a region, but that can very much come down to the practices that are happening in individual fields, what's going on, the whole interest in soil. You know, the fact that everybody is here very much, to me, says you're part of the solution. And to me, there's a, you know, the thing I battle with in the business is finding a measure of how can we measure what we're doing? Because it's easy to put a machine in and say, well, we've gone from that percent to that. Actually, in farming, things take time. Every season is different, you know. Next year, we could be having rain coming off here. Um, we don't know what's coming through, and it's about building in that resilience, and that's the stuff. So we started to do trials. We very much had a focus on uh, on pesticides, but we started to bring in things like cover crop trials. So it's actually quite a holistic approach that's needed, rather than chasing the metaldehyde or, or any one particular uh, issue. Actually, it's the joined-up thinking. And, and, and I think it's also not coming in and saying, we've decided what the problem is, so... This is what it's going to be. And, yeah. and I think my criticism of a lot of the approaches in the past has been somebody from outside that catchment, outside an environment, looks in and says, I've decided what's wrong here, so this is how you can fix it. I, I always say there's no such thing as a farmer because there's rich farmers and poor farmers. There's progressive farmers and conservative farmers. And, and the context within which they farm is really important. And that will influence their decisions. We know basic payments are going away and that sort of stuff. That will have far bigger driver on the behaviours and what farmers can and can't do than any nice pamphlet that we can write. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And again, going back to agriculture, plug two, it's all about from the ground up. It's farmers' experience. It's listening to the farmers to deliver that. And, and that's got to be at the core. And I know that we've had some problems in our catchment. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we set up the farm cluster 18 months ago. But Ian, you managed to get on side a group of farms, and I think you'll probably give another shout out to Jenny Phelps and the team at Flag Southwest. Um, how did you approach how did you approach that? And what what actually have you asked the farmers to overcome your challenges? So um, definitely shout out to Jolie as well from Flag. Um, yeah, just picking up one point about the soil though, I did a, a silt survey, um, unlike that, and um, Along one of our brooks, um, the silt was um, 80 centimetres deep. Um, it varied from 50 centimetres to over a metre in a particular part of the main river. And that's all about soil runoff, quality of soil. Sorry, quality of soil. So in terms of pulling our landowners together, uh, with the fine main rivers that run through Bledington, we've got 10, at least 10 landowners that are involved. And um, as you said, there's a degree of buy-in on this. We've got certain uh, landowners who are absolutely totally committed to NFM, to working um, towards attenuating water, to reconnecting flood meadows, to re-establishing paleo channels and all the other buzzwords that we all use, um, to the other extent where we've got f um, traditional farmers who perhaps aren't quite so amenable to, to change. Um, but certainly in times of um, talking to the landowners, it was it was clear now, yet again, I'm going to pl plug our pub because I'm being sponsored by the King's Head. But basically, all of, <laughs> all of the landowners drinking the King's Head, and it's, it's, it's a joke, but it, it's quite true. They all want to help Bledington because they want to save the pub, partly tongue-in-cheek. But it's quite true, and it's that community approach that we've emphasised and re-emphasised and underlined and italicised and all the rest of it to make sure that the landowners are aware that the work they're doing has a tremendous benefit to the community and the community are very uh, pleased and um, acknowledge the help that the landowners have given us. I'm just going to jump in here. Uh, it's my prerogative to say a few words. We also have been working as, as this big cluster and actually just submitted a landscape recovery bid, uh, pilot bid um, with DEFRA across 3,200 hectares of, of 50 landowners. Um, 
so it's bringing together the, the subcatchments to this one holistic, big scale project. And it's really interesting the different buttons you've got to press for different landowners, where that's Glimpton, Blenheim, Ditchley, and the, the big famous estates to the, to the east of our catchment, or actually some of the father son, you know, quite small farm, uh, multi generational, or the tenants. You know, there's all sorts of different buttons that need pressing and it's a very sensitive issue and we do have experience in the in the cluster of of a very poor approach to farmers uh, and this is what we want and this is what we're going to pay you and this is how you're going to do it and it's so so funny to watch the door slam in the face but actually when it's farmer led or community led and pub led beer led it really does grease the wheels i think and also the problem we've got is um so we're dealing with six different departments from the Environment Agency, Biodiversity, Maintenance, Planning, Legal, um, Funding, and somebody else who I can't remember. Um, so that's six different departments. Our, I did a quick Google on this land, and actually there's no main river running through this farm, I believe, but I do think you have some flooding problems down towards the conurbations to the south of us. Um, main river is EA controlled. So you can't really do anything on your main river without EA approval. And I was chatting to a guy earlier that was having that sort of problem. Ordinary water courses, you, can, you have more leeway. So we have the problem of main river flooding us, but with surface water and, water and, and ordinary water courses also flooding us. So what we've had to do is try and tread. And I think we've actually navigated quite a nimble course through the landowners and talking to them, but also trying to make sure the agencies, and hopefully there are some agency people here, talking to the landowners in the, in the best possible way. Because without their support, as I've said, and I'll underline again, we, we're going to get nowhere. But there is a certain amount of, there's a narrative that seems to be in, 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 in included here where this all takes time. Now, of course, building herbal lays and improving organic matter and all this sort of stuff does. But to actually do some proper natural, uh, uh, proper flood alleviation uh, work actually shouldn't take that much time, especially if it's sensitively done with the land, which is what you're doing, Tim, with the farm clusters on a macro level. We're much more of a micro level. Our catchment, as I say, is quite fairly large, but it is only one, one catchment. So I think at this point, unless the panel wants to contribute anything more on the why and the what, um, we'll come for any questions, points of clarification, comments, and then I think a lot of farmers want to know, well, it's all very well, but how do we fund this? How do we do it? What's in it for us? And, and how can we get this change enabled? So we'll move on to that. But do we have any questions from the audience or points from the panel? Ah. Perhaps to the gentleman in the middle, um, how might you convince a skeptic in terms of the NFM measures? You sound like you've got like a group together. Were they all convinced from the from the get go, and were there those that just you haven't been able to engage with? That's yes. a really good question because I was called dangerous by one of his cluster, but they managed to catch him. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, uh, so na na NFM, and as I said before, uh, Fwag came in and said, we're not flood managers, but they managed to, Joe was brilliant in managing to uh, massage the funds that we became available into doing work on the farm, which actually was NFM work. And that particular farmer bought into it, Tim might be here today, I don't know, but that particular farmer bought into it tremendously and understood the, the, the need for NFM, how it should work, we had an MSN student do a study on a particular tributary of our, one of our main rivers, um, which is now being put forward as a bit of a template to how to, uh, how to go forward, not only for the moment, but then answering the problem about climate crisis to actually future-proof any work that we do. So it takes into account the water that's coming down at us for the moment, but also one in 20, one in 50, one in 100. So to answer your question, um, we found it was important to educate some people. They didn't really realize what was going on. And I am saying landowners here. We've got a landowner behind us who, even last week, said, I didn't really realize that's, that, that was the mechanics of it. That was the mechanism of it. And so pulling that catchment concept together and then presenting that in a coherent way is crucial. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
natural rivers move around. Is that on? Yeah. Can we hear that okay? Yeah. Uh, natural rivers move around, and quite often property boundaries are drawn down the middle of a, a river that's been put in its place by human engineering. So how do we get around that, especially if we want some natural flood management like beavers or whatever, which are going to just change the channels. You need both sides of the river to, to be buying into whatever you want to do. That's that a really, really yeah. good question, because one of our projects, uh, actually in the landscape recovery, what we're aiming to do is stage zero. So basically taking rivers back to their pre-human state. So braided channels, reconnected, lots more flooding, lots more flood storage. But it was something we were talking about in the car on the way up here. <laughs> so Ian, yeah, and, and yeah, Richard, come on to Ian, if that's right. Um, so actually, I am the proud owner of um, half a brook where we live, because I have the riparian responsibility of the village brook that runs right past our door. So um, uh, I'm allowed to clear it and so on and so forth. Um, we're also developing a neighbourhood plan in the parish council. I'm part of the parish council at Pleddington to actually look at that. Parish uh, uh, neighbourhood plans normally look at planning and building and that sort of stuff, but we're actually including the effect of planning in terms of flooding as well. Um, I think if it's a main river, um, there's going to be some arm twisting to get sort of development approval for property being built on Main River, but I, don't quote me on that. Um, so uh, it is an important facet. We we know there's a certain amount of development gone on in Bledington. Huge concrete pads have been put down, which have diverted aquifers and underground water flows um, that the planning has gone through. Now, one particular uh, family did have a report produced, and they've done an attenuation pool and diverted the water around, which is brilliant, um, into where it should have gone in the first place. But it's something we've got to very keep a great close eye on in terms of urban development. I think Richard and Stephen have got something to say on this. So Richard. I think you make a really good point that often we look at these problems in the short term of this is the problem that we have today, rather than in that bigger context. And you know, we've all come, the land has changed. One of the things I often do when talking to farmers is say, Well, what was it like when you were a kid? What was it now? How's it moved? But you know, a lot of people say well, we've borrowed the land from the future generations. But what's going to be changing. And it's talking to the, the farming community as well of how are you going to be farming in five years' time? What are those sort of things there? How does this solution we're proposing now fit into that bigger plan? If it's just we coming in, and, and I'll hold my hand up that, that a lot of organisations have come in and said, there's a problem, there's a solution, the solutions are there now, we can push off. And it is about taking into the, the bigger picture of where you're going to be farming in 10 years' time is going to be fundamentally different. I don't know where it is, but I think it's really important to have those conversations with the farmers in that community. Where do you think it's going to be? And recognise that different people will have different perspectives on there. And through that conversation, if you know, I would say if you can get a, an agreement that the river is a, a key thing, it's going to be moving. The moment you get a point of agreement, then you can separate that out. But it, it, it can be a very full of conflict. Stephen? This is going to be a ramble, so I apologise. Uh, um, and, it, and you've led, led us right into the right place here, Richard. It, 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 it takes time. And you now a 1% change in soil organic matter, uh, or sorry, soil organic carbon, to increase that buffer in the soil gives us 170,000 litres of water holding capacity. That's the stat we needed. I meant to ask it in the previous part. Yeah, so 1%, 170,000 litres of, of, of uh, water holding capacity. And that takes time. And because it takes time, it requires investment. So how do we get land managers, landowners to, to need their, meet their short-term requirements of, of income whilst investing in those, that resilience change? And building soil organic matter from 3%, the big gains are at the bottom end. So building it from 3% to 4% or 5% gives you more water holding capacity than building it from 20 to 20, 25%. The big gains are at the bottom end, and there's plenty of research from the Centre of uh, uh, Hydrology and Ecology on, on that. We're in a really, really um, interesting and significant time within land management and policy at the moment, because for farmers for the last 25 years, it's about been about delivering food, delivering on nature, etc. There are now opportunities with 
corporates and uh, intermediaries to generate contracts for building carbon and being paid for them, to generate contracts for, for building biodiversity. There's corporate social responsibility, there's biodiversity net gain. All these things will help us manage water in a smarter and better way, but in a way that you, each farmers and land managers can get income today for, for delivering things for tomorrow. I think that might be neatly leading to a question. We're going to take two more questions before we go to the next, uh, the next part. Uh, Alex, I suspect you might be saying something on that. We will be going into how we fund it and so on in the next part. But Yeah, thank, thanks very much. That Alex Robinson, uh, Moorwood Farm and Nature Capital. That stat is not put out there anything, anything like enough, and it should be. My question is around... Um, it's the ability to stack payments, both from, you've just identified carbon and the importance of sequestering and storing carbon there in the soils, which we're going to hear a lot of today, I suspect, but actually the benefits that that then provides to, to water, and that's just from a holding capacity, not even a, a quality perspective as well. How can we start to stack some of these, these benefits in a different way to, to, um, to what's being uh, incentivized at the moment? And, you know, a, a water company paying for a, a cover crop well, that's directly competing with a, a stewardship scheme, okay? But, but, but they're both paying for different things. What's being targeted? How can we stack that? Um, how can you, you play your part in that, in that please? I, th I think that's a, a really important part for that next part of the question, but um, particularly with the landscape recovery bid we've been working on is how we blend that finance stack it. And, uh, and, and David Gasker Tucker, who's, who's working on the Ian scheme, but also principal uh, hydrologist, hydrogeomorphologist at uh, Atkins Engineering, um, is, you know, we really want to work out how we can use carbon uh, as a proxy for that storage and sell that storage independently, not as a co-benefit, but actually monetize the water storage. So, Richard, have you got anything to come back on that? I think it's, there is a balance between what we're seeing on the farm as well as what the corporates are seeing. And, you know, although it's, uh, it feels suddenly the buzzword that everybody's talking at the moment is regenerative agriculture, and I'm not talking the farming world, who've been talking it for the last 10, 15 years, it's about suddenly the corporates are, oh, I'm investing in regen ag and those sort of things. I think that's an opportunity because suddenly it's bringing in funding sources that weren't there always. And, and the thing that I'm trying to, to focus on is not about saying any one group needs to be funding it, and it's kind of, I think, tying to where you are, but saying... Everybody can be playing a part. Everybody can invest a little bit. So there may be a proportion of government funding, plus a water company, plus Nestle, Coca-Cola, whoever, depending where they're bringing the supply chain. And the supply chain has a huge amount of influence on what can be done and how much gets paid for that product. And I sometimes think we get... We forget that agriculture is a business, there's a commercial operation, and there are commercial decisions that are made. If we could do everything we wanted to, we would have a very different farming environment, but the economics are there, they're important, and the supply chain is, is really important in driving that. Brilliant. So, the gentleman in the cap, another question. Um, what a brilliant, brilliant conversation. Um, I'd just like to raise the idea of actually administration being by catchment, and the idea that as a farmer, when we go about our business, we, the first thing we need to understand is water. And that is what produces the food. We're in a climate emergency. The concept of really thinking deeply about our catchments would seem to me to be a no-brainer. I'm not suggesting we suddenly turn Berkshire into the Kennet or what have you, but I just think that there's a kind of, there's a psychological change when people actually start to connect with the catchment because it's so critical. I'd just love to know your thoughts on that. And the other thing, you've just tapped into it in the last couple of questions is, uh, the importance of biochar, which sequesters six times its volume in water. It's just phenomenal what it can do. And I guess that is so helpful with waterlogged soils, but also with drought soils and or soils prone to drought. And I guess there is a really big question as how we can lock that carbon up and, um, and maybe do it on farm and so that you're improving the fertility of the soils and also the structure of the soils, the compaction, all those sorts of things. So I'd just love to know your views on those two points. Yeah. So just touching on the point about the t connecting with the catchment, it's only a small point, but we've actually now got otters on the even load. Um, I saw a kingfisher a couple of weeks ago, egrets. Um, so, the, so the biodiversity is certainly there because wetland is being produced as we speak and the work, the NFM work 
is aimed at increasing that biodiversity and I'm aware there are funds available for that and tests um, for density of biodiversity etc so just touching on the catchment connection with the catchment and our local community walk a lot and we've got a superb countryside we've got a superb pub no sorry um, but um, in terms of connecting with the catchment is crucial because not only do they recognize that uh, we recognize our environment is valuable we also recognize that the custodians of that environment are just as valuable to you guys. Stephen. Josh, you, ra you raise Bio a really chart, by the way. Yeah, I've got that. An interesting point about uh, uh, catchment. I, I think there was a danger that the catchment sensitive farming program was going to be lost from Natural England. I think that's been given more emphasis now. So I would highly recommend anybody engage in that. As we get to sort of catchment or even farms within catchments, it strikes me one of the big, biggest challenges as land managers, most of us don't have, a, don't have a clue of how much water flows through our, our land. So a really good place to start in terms of understanding the value or the, the risks around water is farms need to think about actually undertaking a carbon, uh, carbon a, a, a water audit. So... From Richard's perspective, we're talking about portable water. We're mainly talking about drinking water. But what about river water, stream water? What about grey water? What about recycled water, roof water? Um, twice the volume of Windermere goes through washing machines every year. Twice the volume of Windermere goes through our domestic washing machines. How do we recycle that water and how much is going through the farm? We probably know how much comes onto the farm because of the water bill that arrives from Thames or, or, or Anglia or Affinity or wherever it is. But m most of us probably won't have much of a clue of how much water is flowing through the farm and out the other end. So a good place to start is how much water is flowing through the farm, how much do our crops need, how much do our, our, our livestock need. And that's a good starting point because then we can start to engage on a community and a catchment scale basis and looking at where the where the, the peaks and troughs are, uh, the excesses and, and, the, and, and, the, and the losses out of the system. Uh, if we don't know what we've got, how the hell are we expected to manage it? So that's, that's the first part. On biochar, there's great research around in terms of its increase in terms of stable humic compounds to increase water holding capacity. The challenge is gonna be how we can, how we can make sufficient biochar which is quite energy consumptive in terms of actually its manufacture. So we can find ways of, of, of building or making biochar which is less energy consumptive, then, then, then there, is a, there is an opportunity to use it at scale within farming systems. At the moment, it's the energy requirement to manufacture it or to create it is, is pretty energy consumptive. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the uh, natural capital uh, markets, the public funding markets and the mechanisms to get this done. But just actually on the on the catchment point, I think it's really important to uh, think of hydrology in the catchments, but I don't think we should be too fixated on any one particular uh, mechanism for delivering some of these things. So a grey partridge project could spill over into two catchments, for instance. And too often I get from my farm cluster, this is a postcode lottery, I'm just inside the AOMB or just outside, or I'm just in Oxfordshire. And Oxfordshire, Gloucestershire border, it's south, west, south, east. And, and Joe and, and Ian and I know just how tricky it is on that, that, that county boundary. So I think, again, it's about being farmer-led, project-led, and more often than not, that's going to lead to catchment-led as well. Uh, but I think to, to pick one route over any other is, is quite tricky. So that's my piece over. Uh, let's move on to um, uh, funding. And... Uh, I'm sure, Stephen, you're an expert on public fi funding streams, ELMS, uh, <laughs> all the loopholes, all the opportunities, <laughs> gaming the system. Come on. <laughs> well, I, I sort of alluded to it earlier on, but and the gentleman at the back was asking about cone financing and, 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 and stacking. Um, and I think we're in a materially different place today than we were in 10 years ago when actually, as land managers, we were largely relying upon public money, uh, the narrative move from um, direct supports to public money for public goods, well, 
there's no better good than water and, la and landscape. Uh, and, and actually, public money there is going to be more and more available for that resource management. But Treasury have woken up to the idea that actually co-financing is really good because if government, if, if, if the water company or another corporate will pay for it and Treasury doesn't have to, that's a win for government. So there's a real green light in terms of the ability to co-finance. Mm. So if you, can, if you can find projects at a catchment scale or at far, even at farm scale whereby you can attract both private finance from, from corporates, good corporate social responsibility, good biodiversity gain, good resource management, as well as public money from, from government, government streams, there's very much a green light and an open door to allow that to happen. Well, one of our um, cluster members is here actually piloting SFI. Uh, I don't think he's actually in here right now. But in terms of stacking public funding as well, so if you're in a stewardship scheme, don't be put off necessarily going for SFI. I'm not saying it always works, but there could be opportunities in this transition period as well. Richard? Just kind of building on that conversation, I think often at, at, at the field scale, there's a good understanding of, you know, these are the measures, these things I want to try. At, at the corporate level, there's measures of, okay, we've got pots of money here, whether it be government or wherever. Probably, in my opinion, where things are missing is the facilitators that sit in the middle that can bring in a couple of key benefits, whether it be a nature benefit compared to, and, and pass those together into one project. And that's going to be the opportunity in the next five years is those middlemen that sit in a catchment that say, we understand what's needed in there, but I've also got the connections to those funding pots to make things happen. And there might be four or five different projects that all come together that give the total that can be there, but that, that to me is going to be where things grow. And sometimes they're forced into it from having their living rooms flooded. <laughs> Ian? So in terms of um, being the flood group as the centre, if you like, of all this communication, we've certainly found the different agencies that we've been talking to <clears throat> are able to sort of put forward funds to actually help our flooding. So again, if we flood, we don't drought. Hopefully we won't drought in the future. But for example, Thames Water, we've got a £3 million smart water catchment programme. Um, the EA, um, again, uh, facilitated through FWAG, have got something called the Water Environment Improvement Fund, WEEF which we've benefited from hugely um, in terms of the natural flood uh, management schemes up, upstream. Um, Thames Water, we actually speak to Thames Water nicely, and um, they're actually promising to, well, promising, suggesting that they're able to seal manholes along the, the village. We have our pumping station, unfortunately, um, has a record, um, sorry, the sewage works, at 1,500 hours of raw sewage dumping into the river even load last year. But that then needs to be put into context in the sense that we know why that's happening and the billions and billions of pounds it would need to actually rectify it isn't justifiable. And so Thames Water are looking at actually reducing the ingress into their sewage systems. We have a sewage pipe that runs for about five miles that are connecting villages. Um, I think they allow for, is it 10% ingress into sewage pipes through water, surface water and all you guys? Um, so basically what they're doing is, they say, okay, let's try and fund this scheme so that the water isn't actually flowing over our pipes. It's actually going down the streams it should go down and being attenuated in places that it's um, safe to attenuate. So that's three or four different strands of funding that we found, just being able to actually network and utilise our contacts that we've, that we've established. And we are talking to sort of reasonably high up people, decision makers, key, key decision makers, as opposed to people that would just nod and say yes and really don't have the clout. So that's one of the advantages we've found with our united voice is to get to people who actually can make decisions. That's brilliant. And I think, you know, uh, for instance, I think Elms is also trying to, uh, trying to encourage that collaborative thinking, uh, certainly with um, the tier three landscape recovery and you know that's unlocked through FIPPLE grant for us 36 farms across 15,000 hectares to baseline their soil carbon with with Rothamsted and, and with my other hat on um, sorry needless plug um, but uh, I, I think that's really important to think about how we can deliver this at scale and and 
use the same methods and, and then so much stronger in voice when you're negotiating uh, and bringing in that finance. And I, and I think also just to say that it, within the environment agency, one of the important uh, departments is the uh, catchment. And there'll be a catchment coordinator in this area and catchment coordinator in your area. And we've got a brilliant catchment coordinator, Joe Old, who um, is very switched on and is aware of um, the situation from an environmental agency point of view. But then that then crosses over into the farming community because clearly the water th runs through your lands. So to actually have that connection is, is, is critical and the access to bottom line to funding to do this work. Oh, it was kind of two things. One was I think the catchments are really important, but it's important to remember that farmers don't have boundaries just around catchments. So there is that. And, and good practices, you know, if it stacks up economically, if you do it right, it could mean that it actually have a bigger impact. Um, we found a lot of it, instead of focusing on catchments, which is a little bit too often can be too big to really emphasize and, and identify with this is what how I'm managing my land, this is the impact. There's a scale factor that's there. So if it's a group of 100 farmers, does my imp work have an impact? So where can we bring in those sort of measures? What is good? And the thing I often challenge a team is, what does good look like? Not from our perspective, but from a farming side. Because while I'd like to say lots of decisions are made based on scientific papers with lots of stats, a lot of farming decisions are based on trust. Conversations are going to be happening around today, and people are saying, I tried this, I tried that, my confidence on there. And I think that human aspect of conversations is really there. And, and we've got a really good opportunity to, to tie into that. And, and as an organization, as Anglian Water, one of the things we're trying to do is also focus on skip all the very hard science and that sort of stuff there with 20 different replicates and that sort of stuff there. What can we look at? How can we help farmers make a decision. If I'm looking at three different cover crops, let's fund a trial to look at that sort of stuff there so that when you make a decision going forward, you're basing it on some sort of evidence. It doesn't have to be statistically pure. The academics will like that, but I think it's remembering that in that farming environment. And, and we try and position ourselves in a position of how can we help that decision-making process? We, we, I'd love to say we'd have enough money to, to pay for every farmer. But we won't. But if we can help that influence, help make those decisions, then, then I think we, we're on the right track. And just to emphasise that, we've got quite frustrated because the one person that knows what's happening on their land is, is the landowner. You all know where your water is. You, well, I'm sure you do. You know where your wet areas are, your dry areas. And they can be pointed out really quite quickly. And the experts on the land are you the landowners, and we were getting slightly frustrated in that we had to do feasibility studies and topographic studies and um, levels and uh, modelling and so on and so forth. So totally back at what you say. Um, there's the science behind it, but let's have a bit of humanity in terms of understanding what should be done. Oh, it's been at least half an hour since my last agroecology plug. <laughs> But that's exactly what uh, agroecology tries to do, is bring some of that uh, research uh, um, and, and real intelligence behind some of these measures to back up the anecdotal conversations had between farms, between advisors and so on. And then supporting the likes of Stephen. I mean, Stephen isn't just a farmer. He also works the, the country in agroforestry advice and soil advice and all sorts of things. And it's, it's all backed up by a lot of uh, evidence. But actually, it takes that, that warm conversation whether that's from the feed supplier or the, 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 you know, the agronomist or the flag advisor to, to catalyze that. But always you know, have a little look at agriculture or your source of information to, to work out what, others, what are other people doing. I mean, Stephen, I bumped into you on one of our cluster farms, just rolled up to look at agroforestry project. Uh, how have you seen that knowledge exchange evolve over the last 10 years? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, to me, it's blindingly obvious that farmers learn best from farmers that uh, you can read all the research papers you want but actually you want to you know far farming is a risky business at the best of times you you throw your, uh, your your chips into the roulette wheel once a year and and hope for a return and um, farmers want to see something or land managers want to see something that's proven that's tested and and if if other farmers have tried something that they can build upon that peer-to-peer -peer learning, that peer-to-peer -peer, um, knowledge exchange is absolutely crucial. So, translating 
science into palatable solutions and then uh, supporting farmers and facilitating farmers in trying those things is one part of the pie. The second part is actually allowing that or facilitating that exchange uh, between, between uh, different land managers. And then, of course, turning up places like this or Fur Farm Conference or, you know, there's so many places for this rich co sort of content. And I think let's get it back to you guys because you've got the interesting questions, not me. Any more questions? This gentleman at the front. Um, I've worked with Richard quite a lot, and one of the, the issues that we have is enablers and blockers and about double funding. Um, and I think what we want to see is a lot more clarity, really, on that double funding, because if we can get rid of that double funding, um, we can enable more funding to be opened up to farmers. I, I think the 100-odd tests and trials, I don't know how many are they up to now, that are testing that double funding, blended finance sort of, you know, mechanism. And speaking from experience, with the FIPL grants stacking BNG and... and um, other opportunities and terms of water money, you know, it is an absolute minefield, but we don't let perfection get the barrier of progress. I mean, I also think that the worry about double funding is, is sometimes overstated. And this, this is more in terms of when I'm talking to farmers, our overall remit is about soil health. And actually, my feeling is that if we get the soil health right, the service we need is potable, regular supply of water. If by getting that soil carbon up, it means that there's an opportunity for the farmer to get more value because he can sell the carbon, that's an extra benefit. And if he sells that or doesn't do that, to me, I think we need to this oh, and look, double fund that double fund that it makes us more reluctant to dive into things. And I think the more we understand the multiple benefits, if somebody's putting in a particular cover crop in and it gives biodiversity benefits as well as soils. That's a good thing. So that's the approach that we've taken is very much saying, let's say, look at carbon. I don't know where the carbon market is going, but the thing I need out of it is the water quality. It's the, it's the flood attenuation. It's the drought attenuation. It's that sort of stuff. So uh, that, that's where we're trying to put ourselves. I'm not saying we're there definitely, but... Really, as a land manager, it's about having, having clarity around... Um, uh, the, the different segmentation of the deliverables. So most of the most of the public funding is around biodiversity, landscape um, uh, management. It, most most of the Elms money is around. It's not around water. It's more around biodiversity. So being clear about I'm delivering biodiversity with this pot of money, and I'm delivering water quality or flood alleviation with this pot of money, and I'm delivering carbon with this pot of money. As a land manager, if I can provide clarity in what my objectives, ambition, and deliverables are, then there should be no issue about stacking these things together because they're coming from different pots of money. I think that's going to evolve out of the carbon markets as well with the additionality, you know, the four tests of additionality. But it's uh, also as we go from prescriptive techniques to generate these outcomes to actual ground truthing measurement of the genuine outcomes. Maybe that's a way that, you know, selling carbon that has genuinely been fixed or selling the birds that are genuinely being surveyed and uplifted on your farm may, may help disentangle that as well. But it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, so did you want to go there and then? Okay. Yes. Um, I suppose this is a question probably for, for everyone, but maybe more for Ian and then Stephen to start with. Is um, so Matt Clegg from uh, Binney's. Um, we do a lot of work for NRWEA and, and water companies. Is twofold. Um, how much of a barrier at the start of the journey you were on, Ian, was access to data around what the, the issues were? How much of that was a barrier? And then, kind of linked to that, how much was access to funding at the start of that journey also a, a barrier? So, access to data, um, we we sort of set out by not starting there in the first place. Um, we did a, um, a hydro hack, I think you guys call it in the profession, but we walked the water course with the land owners and worked out where the water was uh, causing a problem, eyeballed it and said, right, this is what we think should happen. We accept totally that it, the science behind it might prove it not to be the case. 
Um, so then we were hamstrung slightly because we needed to have a, a level survey done. So that was funded by our very uh, na friendly neighbourhood lead local flood authority who had bought into the concept of protecting Bleddington. So in terms of funding on the data side, that was actually fairly accessible. However, only in, it was only in after we'd alerted them to the problem. And that's fair enough, I suppose. Um, in addition to that, obviously, we've had access to funding through the EA, and I mentioned the WEF funding, which actually, without that, I think we'd have struggled to do the amazing work that's happened upstream. I can't, I won't embarrass her by saying how good she is, but um, she's in the audience. But the amazing work that was done up there was off the back of funding. Now, the farmer has also bought into it totally, and he's suggesting he's going to match fund the, the amount of input that's been put into his farm, because he's taking a benefit from it as well. He's actually benefiting from it. A new cash crop that he's got, willows. Uh, he, he's incredibly keen on wildlife, so he's got snipe and uh, waterfowl uh, appearing on his land that he's delighted with. Um, so the initial, we've not had a massive problem with money, believe it or not. Um, that isn't our problem. <laughs> we haven't got it coming out of our ears because we're in Chipping Norton land, you know, it's sort of, but it is um, fully supported and recognised that funding needs to be spent. It's how do we direct that funding and how do we get approval and uh, get it delivered? That's our main problem. I'd go back to my earlier point, which really is, is most, <clears throat> most farmers haven't got good data at a, at a far more catchment scale. And if we're going to start, if we want to attract funding to engage in positive change, we need to know what we've got to sell. So a really good place for us all to start is to, you know, uh, measure how much water is flowing through the, through the estate, measure the green, you know, the blue water, the grey water, the green water, um, and, and work out where our inputs, outputs are and what the quality of that is. Then we know what we can go to go to uh, the market to schemes to to offer. And, and if I may go back to another point about working collaboratively and building that data set as a as a group and building a cluster, you're going to have much more clout when you're trying to release that funding. Um, and there, certainly around us, we're awash with funding. There's so many pots, but some of it is really bureaucratic to unlock and can be really soul destroying. But I think it's worth being you know, pers persevering and doing it as a group and appointing, you know, a, a, a facilitator or, you know, an advisor from FWAG or, or whoever to try and galvanise that and represent you so that you all sing off the same hymn sheet and it will unlock that. The funding will come, definitely. Um, there's a gentleman at the back, a couple of minutes left, and then a lady at the front as well. Yeah, hi there. Um, basically, all I was going to say is there's um, an element of this as well is all to do with the jargon busting of all of the terminology that's around nature-based solutions, working with natural processes, NFM, and all that sort of stuff. You need to break that down because there's a lot of farmers can understand what they can do if they actually know what it actually means in the first point of accessing that extra funding. And the other point that I was going to make with this regarding, uh, it was more of a question to you guys as well, is how are you managing the expectation both on both sides? Because you've got to manage the expectation of the farmer to understand when it's working, but also understand from a person who's actually being flooded that you may actually get flooded, but it's just the expectation of getting flooded less, not that you'll never get flooded. And is that how you've managed that would be interesting. Certainly in terms of expectation of farmers, um, and uh, Tim's already alluded to this, uh, it varies again, and it's what you were saying about it's not, it's not just one title farmer. So the, guy, the farmer that's um, totally bought into the NFM work and I do apologise, the ac acronyms are all our lives, it's, it's ridiculous. The only acronym that has more syllables in than its own name is Thames Water. Um, but th they, they, yeah, they're coming out of our ears, FWAG, WEEF, so on and so forth, and we did find that quite difficult. And to speak to a farmer who wants to get on his tractor and drill for five hours, you know, he's not necessarily going to want to listen to all the jargon words, like regen, for instance, you know. Regen in Flemish means rain, believe it or not. So it's sort of like, what are all these terms that you're banding about and do you do, that we're banding about and do the landowners actually n understand what that is? Managing expectation, well, as a community, we've got a very strong 
um, community and we communicate. I write a newsletter every month. We have meetings. So in terms of managing the community um, expectations, they're fully read in to what's going on and are hoping that we can solve uh, the flooding issues. As far as expectations for the farmer, um, again, that is actually speaking their language, coming up and, and utilising the skills that we've got for that with all the agencies that we've got involved. I'm really sorry, we're overrunning. So a really quick question and then a, a, a final 10 word summary from each of our panellists. A really quick one. Uh, we're farmers from the top of the watershed in the Yorkshire Dales. I've been tri doing trials on using wool under the soil to actually absorb water in the winter. And I'm finding with soil monitors that it's actually holding um, water in the summer. Um, the, my trials and soil monitors show that it does work really, really well. Plus, we've got nitrogen and sulfur coming out of it. My big problem is we don't do any tilling at all. Um, we just make silage and hay. We don't disturb the soil at all. So I don't know anything about how I would get the wool under the soil without disturbing the soil too much. So if there's anybody who is interested to have a word with me afterwards to give me some advice how I get the wool under the soil without disturbing the soil too much, I had thought it'd be quite a good thing for the potato growers, for contract potato growing, because I understand there's big problems there. Um, so come that sounds me. like a, come a and project. Find me if you if you think you can a, help. A project for innovative farmers. If you don't know innovative farmers, go and look them up because that could be a really interesting one. But I'm sure Stephen's got something in ten words. And, well, a new market for wool is is it sounds sounds wonderful. It's nice stable carbon. So so great. Yeah. So I, I guess my my ten words to finish, so we can all go and get lunch are a that uh, beer is 98% uh, water so that's a good link um, uh, um, and, and I guess my, my few words are water is going to become more and more important in terms of too much and too little and start the journey by understanding what we've got on our own land um, uh, look you know looking at doing a, a water audit um, to try and um, try and place more emphasis on it, and from there we'll flow. Nice little pun. Uh, how we might be able to attract funding to manage that resource better. Ian, ten words. Don't know why you looked at me when you Don't mentioned cheat. beer. <laughs> Dreadful. Um, just to reiterate, um, the community relies on, uh, protecting the community relies on the landowners. To an extent, the landowners rely on the community for goodwill, etc. Um, we need to go forward. We need to attenuate water where it's safe. We need to convey water past where it's dangerous. Um, and all of those methods, all of those mechanisms need to be understood by both the community and the landowner to implement them effectively. Um, I would kind of reiterate that original comment of it's, not, it's going to be getting more difficult. We're going to have more floods, floods and more droughts and there's going to be more demand. From a farming perspective, I think it's really important thinking about not what you're doing next year, what's your five-year plan, what's your 10-year plan, and making sure the solutions that are coming in are tying in for that long-term side of things. There is a certainty in terms of uh, you know, land tenure and those sort of things, but what do you want to do in five years? Make the solutions you're doing now part of that because the opportunities around carbon and nature, we've got some here, new ones will be coming through, but it's that direction of travel that I think is really important. And I'm going to give you 10 words as well. Work collaboratively. Measure carbon. Agroecology. Agroecology, 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 agroecology. King's Head. And King's Head. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>